we're going to take the last uh, hour on the development of concepts during childhood. And then the first hour of next week will be um, true concepts. So uh, we're separating these by a week, so you are very clear on the difference. Okay? Now, co concept is usually understood as a, a, a form of thought. But as we discussed earlier on, thought, insofar as it's sort of meaningful and real, is connected to actions, your activity. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, but I have all sorts of little stupid scenarios and arguments going on here all the time. Don't amount to a hill of beans, to use an American term, right? But, To the extent that I'm, I'm really thinking, and the, the sort of conceptual forces at play, then my thinking is connected to action. Now, the other thing is, we think about concepts as a form of thought. But Newton's law of gravity, I mean, I don't know if there is such a thing, but let's talk, it sounds like it should be. Newton's law of gravity. Now, that's not just something in my head, right? I went to school and I got taught it, and everybody else already knew it, and I read about it in a book. Yeah. I don't say it existed even before people thought of it, now that wouldn't be true. But I, it's not just something in my head, in fact I could get it wrong. Right. I could have a concept which was not the right concept. Right. That it's, it's objective in that sense as well, in the sense it can be normative. So, that's since we've been talking about concepts during these workshops. You would have had a, a concept of these things to start with, but there's a concept that has an objective existence, exists through literature mainly, and what people say. Right? So, what I'm saying is a concept is a form of activity. And what do I mean by saying um, the Newton's law of gravity is a form of activity. Well, in um, all the sort of scientific work people do about gravity or in teaching or in developing theories of physics or something, that one figures. So it makes sense only in the context of the activities of which it's a part. So, both in the sense of Make, making sense of it as, as a thought form, it has to be displayed. I mean, the concept I have is exhibited or make manifest or realized, in fact, by my actions. But also in the sense of it being something one learns about and finds out there in the world, you find it implicit in or even being uh, an explanation of the, the sense of uh, people's activity. So the simple summary of that is to say a concept is a form of activity. And Vygotsky understood that, so how he studied concepts was through observation of actions. And there's a very, very, very famous series of laboratory experiments uh, which were carried out by one of his associates in 1928, uh, which is the, where he, he gave um, young children um, uh, problems to solve, uh, sorting blocks into groups, and then he, uh, each of the blocks had um, uh, characters or little words, short words, nonsense words, written underneath them, which uh, the words uh, implied them that they were all the same thing. If, if oh, this block and that block and that block are all goo, then you think, well, what's goo about them? I don't know what goo is. Oh, you mean they're all green? Oh, I see. Right? So the, the kids were given the puzzle by, uh, through a game, that there are children in a foreign land that uh, use these things as toys, and they call um, uh, certain of these toys goo. Which ones do you think are the goo? And the child will start and say, oh, this one and this one. I mean, children do that. No basis whatsoever. They'll have a guess. and say, oh, well, look. 
And by these very clever ex experiments, which begin with a child having a problem to solve and then intervening and showing them signs that will help them solve that problem, he's able to observe the, the actions of the children in sorting these blocks into groups. And that way, uh, explores what kind of concepts that they're able to form and, and observe how as time went on and older and older children they can solve more um, difficult problems and form more and more uh, uh, accurate concepts. Okay. So the first thing is the concept of form to solve some problem. They all, that's not so much uh, like a statement of fact, but a statement of method. That if we understand the concepts there because it solves some problem, we'll approach it in a certain way. Someone might not say, oh, look, no, uh, motorway. What's, what's solving a problem about a motorway? Well, when these things first started getting uh, built in New York, they were given a different name because different road rules applied and different rules for tearing down neighbourhoods to build them applied, right? So they took on a special name and they were associated, right? So a certain type of road did need a different name and it was a specific concept. So uh, creating motorways uh, solved the problem, it created many more problems than those it solved, but nevertheless it solved the problem uh, in getting uh, people, uh, not allowing people to live miles and miles away from the city and then coming to the city and work, right? And that's sort of what motorways are for, other things as well. So that was a concept picked at random. Um, we see concepts as solutions to problems and it, it, that drives the way you investigate concepts. The, the previous people that have done very similar experiments to what Vygotsky's colleagues did took it as a, a pattern recognition problem uh, and, uh, and, and memorization. Showed kids a lot of things and say which ones uh, belong to that some group or whatever, and that's oh, I think it's those ones. But that, that, the the difference was made by introducing signs that would help them solve a problem, and this is what suddenly shed light on the processes that were taking place. Now, when you do this kind of stuff in a laboratory, you're not investigating true concepts. All this laboratory kind of stuff that goes on to this very day. Uh, it is just very superficial investigation. It doesn't come anywhere near uh, explaining or comprehending or understanding or dealing with in any way the concepts which make up human life. If you take human beings away from their conditions of life and put them in a laboratory and show them coloured cards and this and ask them silly questions and check boxes, you get a result, but it's nothing to do with conceptual thought. Nonetheless, Vygotsky was able through this kind of experiment to uh, find out, to track how children uh, develop concepts. And he realised that, that these weren't true concepts, which required special investigation in their own right, but it could still allow you to track how concepts are formed. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to run through all these different types of concepts, which are different forms of activity, uh, and see if we can uh, grasp them. There are quite a lot of quite distinct types of concepts that Vygotsky turned up. The first one are called syncretic concepts. I've likened syncretic concepts to you're sitting in a train uh, and the countryside goes by in the windows and you just have one damn thing after another. And what the view from the window is a syncretic concept. It's just one damn thing after another. So w what this means translated in, into the kind of experiments is a, a child will pick up one block and then pick up the next block that strikes their eye. And then I'll, they'll say this one and I'll, they'll make a group out of them with nothing more to it than they, were, that they struck their eye. And uh, apparently Charles Darwin uh, in, described his grandchild, uh, and Vygotsky reports this, 
uh, saying, looking, pointing at a duck and saying a uh, gut or whatever, and then pointing to a, a pool of water and saying duck, and then pointing to a coin and saying duck. Right? And the connection between the different things which are duck may only be that they were the thing that struck the child at that moment. But where, when you don't have language, <laughs> and even your ability to pay attention to something or hold something in your mind for longer than five seconds hasn't yet developed, where do you start from? You just start picking out something from its background and naming it. You don't know what to name it, but you have a go. You know? So language develops from this kind of thing. The first concepts are syncretic, and what that means is it's, it's really a census collection. But Vygotsky actually with his magnifying glass and his micrometer, manages to find three different stages of development of syncretic concepts. The first being an absolutely incoherent heap. The, the next one, he says, is just connected subjectively by um, the, the, for instance, the, what met the child's attention uh, one time after another. And then he says the highest development of syncretic concept is those there, where he, he, the child grabs a group of things together in some way and says them. And, and that's a, the, as far as you can go with the syncretic concept. But I don't see a lot in breaking it down. We get the idea of syncretic concept. Uh, by the way, one way of, of, of tracking this concept development is political life. You know, the way concepts develop in politics is very much like the concept development among infants. You know? It's at about the same level. Um, so it's a way of, of thinking it. Okay, the next whole great stage of, of, of development of concepts among infants or ill-informed adults is called complexes. And what's involved in a complex is where a feature of something is abstracted from it and then groups of different objects are gathered together under the concept having that same feature. So you can say redheads. Right? A completely uh, inessential attribute of someone, the colour of their hair, allows you to, to form a concept of gingers or redheads. Right? That's a, a complex. Now, as it happens to this very day, uh, the mainstream philosophy regards that as a concept. It's quite intriguing to see people who actually in their professional life develop very sophisticated concepts but when asked to say what a concept is, we'll say it's a group of things sharing some attribute in common. They had critique of that by Wittgenstein, who said, proved that that was just nonsense, but he was never able to go so far as to say what the other concept was. So in the main, our mainstream positivist philosophy is still at the stage that children are at in regarding or taking concepts to be complexes. That is to say, um, a group of things that have some feature in common. Now, Vygotsky developed four stages of development of complexes, which is a chain complex, an associative complex, a collection complex, and a diffuse complex. Um, I'll explain briefly what they are. A chain complex is where there's a connection from A to B, like redhead, but from B to C, it might be female, from C to D, it might be um, neighbor, whatever. So the, the, the group is formed where there's a connection from one to the next, but the connection is different in every case. Yeah. So you might say, oh, this is you know, another case of terrorism. So what are you talking about? It's just like the other one, whatever. Yeah. There might be very little in common with the one before, but you can form a complex by taking a series of events and being manifesting the same thing, because one was connected to the previous one all the way back, but they have very little in common as a whole. The next thing is an associative complex, where basically you have a prototype and then other things that are associated with that. So you say, uh, look, we don't want a leader like so-and-so, who never consulted, so you, you form a concept of, of, of non-consultative people that are like a central figure that you all have in mind at the moment might be the person who doesn't consult. Mm -hmm. The collection complex is an instrument that's a little bit uh, off-centre from this. 
it's where I mean all children that I've come across go through a certain stage where they, they have mummy bear, daddy bear and baby bear right? that they sort things into nice little collections it's a very definite stage of child development and that's called a collection complex that is the, the forming of concepts of things that go together that actually isn't the abstraction of a sensuous feature but uh, of, a, of a functional feature like table, plate uh, you know, because there's a name for table, your tableware. Yeah, your tableware, there's a, a collection complex. And finally, a diffuse complex, which is really a wonderful thing. This is very often found in political life, where you take a concept which stands up within a certain realm where you formed it, and then you extend it beyond your experience. Like I said, everyone knows that the household has to balance its budget, so therefore the government has to balance its budget. So it's, excuse me, the government prints the money. No, no, no. Everyone knows you can't run up a bit on your credit card. So that's a diffuse complex. It, it makes perfectly good sense within the realm of your own experience, but if you extend it beyond that, it starts making nonsense. Right? So it, it loses its coherence, becomes diffuse. Now, the, it's interesting, the way Vygotsky presents these, he presents them as like different uh, forms of activity, I'd have to say. He, he, I find it easier to understand what's going on with these uh, different types of concepts by reifying certain abilities and, 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 and assuming that the child has a certain kind of faculty to abstract and a faculty to, to synthesize groups of things based on um, a feature, uh, a faculty to hold a feature in consciousness so, for example, if I, I want to know old people that look like the Mona Lisa, I've got to be able to hold a good image of the Mona Lisa in my mind for a long time while I'm watching out for people that look like that. Right? So, um, there's three different abilities. And you could say forming complexes requires each of those abilities, and there's no reason to suppose that those abilities will, will develop uh, in the same way, at the same pace. They can develop quite independently. My ability to abstract a feature from something uh, and perhaps give a good instant description of it is, doesn't mean I'm going to remember that description of those features um, one minute later or that I'm going to be able to recognise one of those features in another object in a different circumstance. Now, Vygotsky doesn't do that. Uh, and, uh, all I can only say, this is a way of remembering and understanding them. Uh, and it's interesting that he doesn't. He doesn't see concept formation as being the development of sort of mental faculties. He sees it as a form of activity. And that's what he sees in the lab. He doesn't see a mental faculty. He sees children that, for instance, form an associative group. Right? Now, so I really shouldn't teach this business. There's an, you know, a faculty of abstraction, a faculty, uh, a faculty of remembering, and a faculty of synthesizing. Because Vygotsky doesn't teach that. And on reflection, you can see why he doesn't. Because they're completely like uh, hypothetical, intangible uh, uh, thoughts, aren't they? I, I can't support the idea of the existence of these faculties at all. I mean, I could. I could do probably. Um, experiments targeted at, at, at those particular abilities but what, what we're interested in was complexes and those were the type of complexes that um, we found chain complexes, associative complexes, collection complexes and diffuse complexes and, and we describe them as such and that's why I feel reinforced in my conviction that I should call complexes forms of activity not mental phenomena or uh, abilities or any such thing, the forms of activity. Now, there's a next stage, like a sort of a third level of what's uh, worked out in the lab, and that's pseudo concepts. And what a pseudo concept is, is where the child develops, um, if, if it follows the way adults refer to things and get sufficiently skilled at that, that that they actually sort of know the meaning of every word. If 
um, if you say, where's the key, the, 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 the child knows what, what a key looks like. And if you say, um, um, what, what's the key for this uh, computer program, they also understand that it's not a little brass thing that's in the drawer in the kitchen. Right? But they get to understand what each word refers to, but as Vygotsky says, it creates an illusion that the adult and the child are talking about the same thing and they're not. Because the, the adult is thinking in terms of concepts and the child is thinking in terms of well-honed complexes. Complexes that have been honed to the point that they match exactly what's being referred to with a concept. But, but a concept is not just uh, a bag that contains everything with a certain combination of features. It, it's, um, it's a concept. Concepts arise in the big world out there uh, of social, political and professional life. And they're passed down uh, through hundreds of years. Like uh, the, the other day I was going on about how we still fight the Battle of Hastings, us English speakers, in now uh, differentiating between Latin-based words and Anglo-Saxon-based words. And our concepts, likewise, are, are developed in certain situations um, when they are needed to solve a problem, and then they're passed on. As they're passed on, the connection of, of the concept with the problem that's solved gets a bit remote. But it's still, it's a concept. It's like a predicament. The difference between a pseudo concept and a concept is the same as the difference between the uh, environment understood as a set of factors, number of parents living, parents income, parents ages, numbers of siblings. Uh, the description of a, of a child's environment in that way is a pseudo concept. It's just, it doesn't grasp the situation because people are poor. <laughs> Forget you know, adding all these things up, they're poor, that's it. You know, um, it, it, it just is a list of factors. Whereas when you have a concept, you grasp it as a situation. It's a, it's a specific problem that offers uh, sort of options or opportunities to be resolved. Right? So all, all concepts, real, true concepts, are like that. The, the, the claim that they're all I'm sort of doing next week's already, but that's okay, we'll have forgotten all this by next week. Look, Vygotsky himself mistook a pseudo concept for a concept as late as 1928. Um, or 29, actually, or maybe even 1930, when I think of it, when there was a particular book that was published where he, he uses uh, what he later called a pseudo concept as a definition of a concept. Um, but it's not the case. Uh, a concept, just, uh, in fact, um, I mean, in, in, in researching concepts, I, I bought authority books on concepts, big, thick books, everything you ever wanted to know about concepts. And on page one, it'll tell you that a concept is a collection of things gathered together according to certain features. And the rest of the book is about, you know, um, when does something have round corners, or when is it a circle? You know, and where do you draw the line between a circle and a square with round corners? And all big, weighty questions like this. Yeah? Uh, in fact, um, well, it was, it's a bit of a bee on my bonnet, this I accept, so I should get myself under control here. Um, the pseudo concept can correctly name all the things that are grasped under a concept but it doesn't know why they all together. The why may not be understood by a person using the concept either, because they've just inherited the word through cultural history. But the way they grasp it is still quite different from the way uh, we come to it uh, as a pseudo concept. Now, I think that might be a good time for me to just take a, a break for discussion about that. Just let me check on what I'm planning for the rest. Oh, yeah. 
Are we okay on this? Um, yeah. I'm a question, but um, could an example of that be, like, bring it when I, I studied engineering, and then there'd be people that would know which equation to use to solve certain problems, mm. but it doesn't mean that they actually understood what was happening in the equation. Yeah. Absolutely. We yeah. are, okay, this is the problem, this is the equation, I yeah. use a couple of these numbers here, yeah. there, yeah. there. Yeah. That's a very good way of explaining it, actually, because we all know that in, well, I presume we all know that in learning uh, technical topics, like or any topic really, when you go through it and you, you learn it, uh, like through a university level, then there's a certain requirement to grasp the topic so that you don't have to remember what book to go to, remember what equation applies in this circumstance. I mean, thermodynamics was a classic. No, uh, uh, have you done thermodynamics? Yeah. 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 This is sort of another one. In, in an education, the, the context. Uh-huh. Children, children, you know, are asked to memorize timetables yeah. without understanding what multiplication is. Oh, times tables. Yeah, always times time tables. tables. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, times tables. Yeah, yeah, like yeah that's right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the... The, the, the issue of times tables is quite challenging, I might say. Um, it, it is an example, but I mean it's challenging because the don't presume from what you said that they also understand what multiplication is before learning the times table, right? Because that's a different question, right? Um, the, the, I mean, there are people that say so, and you know, education is is like an unending war. Yeah, it's the war of the worlds, and, and, and you have to be a brave person to step into it, right? But um, there, is so, there is at least a valid basis for saying, learn your times tables, and then we'll work over and we'll be able to make sense of them, and we'll learn what multiplication is. Mm. Yeah? Uh, well, but there's a different thing, isn't it? Distinction. Distinction. As an example. That's right. Yeah. The kind of distinction that, that, that I like to is in bureaucracy. Um, the, because bureaucrats have to deal with large numbers of people in large numbers of situations and avoid arguments so far as possible. Everything is decided by checkboxes. Um, and you say, you know, um, if you've got a job application, you work out a questionnaire and people tick yes, got that qualification, yes, had that number of experience, and so on, yes, the right age. Right? And that is a case, I mean, bu- bureaucrats, well, for instance, if you work for a university and you want a, a lecture theatre, you have to specify what features you want. Do you want an installed computer? Um, do you want um, you know, whatever? Different, you want an overhead projector? And so on. And then they, they check down the list to see which lecture theatre has the right features for you, and then you can get assigned them. Now, they'll also have a set of checkboxes about you as well. Don't you worry. Uh, okay, and that whole... The, the, the contradiction is that when people enter uh, civilization and come across sciences and uh, arts and all the highly developed forms of, of activity and thinking which characterize civilization, they simultaneously come across bureaucracy. And it's hard for people to separate the, the characteristics of bureaucracy which dehumanise them and, and take a person and strip them down to their attributes, weight, height, education, marital status, experience and so on, from um, the um, true concepts which come through the development of culture. It's the, it, it, um, at the same time, in pre-literate societies, you don't have pseudo-concepts, really. I don't think. Most concepts are true concepts, because they're, 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 they're things that are, 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 are in, in life outside of uh, civilization, you, you don't deal with large masses of numbers of things. Things are understood for their significance for you, and are so named. And there'll be, generally speaking, a very large vocabulary for these things. And things that may to an outsider 
be distinguished just by um, uh, some external feature will be regarded as quite different to an indigenous people. In actual fact, so the, 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 the thinking of people in non-literate societies tends to be very rich in true concepts, even if it's not scientific. But because it's not scientific, um, your anthropologists often miss this. And uh, well, there's very sad stories like that. Um, is that okay? Anyone else got a way of explaining it? Had a couple of good explanations of the difference? Yes. Uh -huh. And they had all sorts of ideas about what a refugee was, and some of them were true, yeah. um, but a lot of them thought they were people that came on boats. Yeah. Um, and they also carried with them a lot of notions of emotion and positive and negative political connotations, mm. um, depending on, I think, who their parents were or what they'd been privy to in yeah. past experiences. But they were pseudo concepts of refugee, for the most part, I think because they, they weren't actually kind of standing, they, they didn't kind of understand the whole complexity of what a refugee was mm. um, in the political, not able to return to their country. Yes. Yes, there's a, a lot of complexities going in there, isn't it? Asking that question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's a good place to start. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because... Um, but those are pseudo their understandings of a refugee. Yeah, because overwhelmingly, unless they're in a household where there's a desire of a lot of sympathy for refugees or there's real tangible connections, the only thing they're going to get is a series of images which show people coming on boats and, and, and very, very superficial connections between people. So that's what a refugee is, you know, they're people that sew their mouth together and live in these, uh, you know, these detention centres and something, which is, you know, of course, not true. Mm. Okay. So the highest development that, uh, 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 that can be developed by children um, is, generally speaking, the pseudo concept. The nothing is absolute in this world. Right? Nothing is absolute, and doubtless, uh, if through life experience, uh, children find themselves in a wider world uh, that they will have the opportunity and the necessity to learn uh, true concepts. But generally speaking, children learn how to name things accurately, it's how to recognise what something is. They don't come across things so much in um, terms of their social significance. Now, there are, outside of those Con concepts which are mostly complexes developing up developing up to a point of complexes which completely match a true concept in what is subsumed under it. There are a couple of other types of concepts that enter in childhood. One of them is called potential concepts. And uh, admittedly Vygotsky's what he has to say about potential concept is quite vague and ambiguous. But as I understand it, um, a potential concept is like a, a, a a unit of practical intelligence. Uh, even animals have potential concepts. They're not concepts, but they have the potential to. So we see this dog here who knows that that lead means walkies, and he's acting accordingly. So he's <coughs> developed an association between his lead and uh, the chance to go and see all the other dogs and have a bit of exercise and run around. So he has formed a concept around that lead. And children will do the same around different um, situations um, and objects and people. They will develop a concept of its significance, but they won't necessarily uh, develop that to a concept. It will be part of their practical intelligence. It isn't yet verbalized. But that practical intelligence is a type of concept or is made up of a type of concepts, but it's not yet developed to be what you could truly call a concept. And then the other thing is pre-concepts. Pre-concepts, uh, I've illustrated this with a group of kids playing chess, and I find this a classic example of 
what a, a free concept is. You know, you can have 10 year old kids who can beat the pants off with a game of chess. And you say, well, how can you tell me that this kid isn't capable of forming true concepts? Look at that way he, he fenced my knight off in the corner while he was capturing my bishop or whatever. Fair enough, sir. Um, so the, the thing is that the, the world of a, of a child is, is a relatively limited world. If it's not a limited world, uh, what's the name of that Pakistani girl? She's not a child in that sense any longer. Um, yourself is? Yeah. What's the name? Mahalia. Mahalia. Yeah. I mean, her experiences have taken her beyond the family home. And even before she became famous, clearly she had outgrown childhood. But the, the normal childhood uh, arrangement is one where you're cared for. And the, the, the world, the world of, of, of how does one get money to pay bills and, and why the hell, you know, is, 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 hasn't Dad got a job? These are, are over the horizon for you. You, you have a role within the family, and you, your conceptual thinking is like that. Like I said, it, nothing is absolute or cast in stone. There are plenty of exceptions to that. But what we're, if we're looking at the type of conceptual development which is normally associated with children, we're looking at children that don't actually have an idea of what a, um, a refugee is. It's outside their experience. All they'll be able to tell you is, is uh, what they've learned from their parents. It'll be a decade probably before those kids have a chance to independently form their own concept of what a refugee is through experiences. Now, the, the ability to take a finite set of rules and understand how to work with those rules logically is something that children can grasp perfectly well. And in fact, they, they can do that supremely well. Not necessarily going to be able to translate that into the big wide world of social and prof professional life. Like I remember seeing a TED speech um, maybe a year ago by this bright young student who decided that um, we could solve all the problems of the world with drugs. That, that you have drugs that could increase people's intelligence and drugs that would do away with people's antisocial behaviours. And he really thought he had stumbled on a solution to the world's problem. With the development of science and development of drugs and medicine, all these antisocial behaviours around the world could be got rid of. Um, I mean, that's, uh, uh, I mean uh, what amazed me was he was put on a platform for a TED talk, but um, it's a typical view of a child. He's received a certain education, and he's learned about how drugs can, can produce changes in the personality. He sees the world's got a lot of personality problems. Oh, put this with that and we'll solve them. Okay. Now, he, he was probably a whiz kid on the chessboard. Yeah? May have been able to solve mathematical problems to beat everyone. But clearly, he's not yet um, encountered the adult world. Yeah? Yes? So, I, I'm just wondering, going back to Sido concepts and this idea that a child cannot have a concept of a refugee because they are only, they only have the experience of what other people have told them. Mm. But is that not true of all of us? No, no. Well, I'm a refugee. I was a refugee. I'm back in my own country now, but I, I left here. And, and, and being a, a refugee from conscription in the Vietnam War meant leaving um, behind me my, my life and things. And it meant lots of things, and it, and it gave me different feelings. It, it put, put a certain cast on Britain's uh, uh, immigration laws and the, the necessity to get a, a three-month permit every three months until we could clock up a number of years. I, I mean, the, the... can put it... See, knowing the meaning of a word really is, is understanding the, 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 the problem that it solves and, and, and sort of really understanding it. Now, as an adult, one has... Uh, the kind of um, mediated understanding of a lot of things. Right? You don't necessarily have to be a refugee to understand what a refugee is, but you will have faced the problem of, 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 of not actually being able to keep your family. You will come across the problem of being at odds with the government. You will have come across the, the problem of, of, of being in a neighbourhood where you weren't accepted. 
you will have had life experiences which key into that particular one of a, a refugee. And, and I said it's quite possible, I mean there are, there are chartered refugees that have enormous life experience and well understand what it is, but in a sense that they've been denied their childhood. Yeah? Yeah, I mean uh, the classic case is your child soldier. The, the child soldier cannot understand the, 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 the bestiality of the things they do. And in fact they're, they're, they're recruited precisely for the fact that they don't understand what they're doing. They can be made to torture people in the most terrible ways that you have great difficulty getting out of to do because they don't really understand it, what, what they're doing. Right? Um, and in my view that they do have concepts because they can only get to do these terrible things uh, through having a concept of what they're doing. It, but it'll be, it'll be an a, a awful concept. I mean, uh, fundamentalist religion is an example of, of a true concept, but it's a, sort of a very ugly concept. Yeah? Uh, and and it, if children grasp true concepts uh, before they are psychologically developed to, to really understand them, they get them prematurely, then, then it's a pathology. So, uh, like the, the child in Vygotsky's example who had to grow up fast and be the senior man in the house and look after the kids and control his mother's drunken behaviour, did grow up and make a development. But I bet he would rather have, have had a childhood and a youth and an education and he'll probably carry the, those gaps in his own development with him for the rest of his life. Yeah, so look, there's nothing cut and dry here. Really my idea is just to give you the concepts and if I, I make some of the statements to explain something, I'm sure there's a million and one exceptions and qualifications which I'm skirting over. And, and I don't want to imply that that's not the case. But, so, uh, yes? You sort of draw a distinction between child and adult, but it seems that different adults with different political outlooks would have different ideas of true concepts. Like a Pauline Hanson's view of a refugee would be different yeah, from yeah. The, the, your, your view of a refugee. Yeah, there's two different things here. That I, ma I made cast dispersions on positivist philosophy. You know, professional philosophers, you know, in the philosophy department in this university, if you ask them what a concept was, they'd, they'd define a pseudo concept for you. And that's because there's a general rule that, that, that when you have learnt something and you, you act uh, unconsciously, without reflection, you can perform very well. But when you think about what you're doing, your performance drops down a level. So a philosopher who may develop all sorts of very sophisticated concepts, when you're asked to actually describe what the concepts are, they give the very debased and degraded concepts of that. Okay, so um, our political leaders are conceptual thinkers, there's no doubt about it. Uh, and the present one is at a very low level. John Howard, for example, undoubtedly a master of conceptual thought, right? But the what 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 they do in in public communication is a little bit like the difference between the the the, the arts and sciences which characterise civilisation on one hand and the bureaucracy which is needed to manage large numbers of people on the other. There's a gap there, right? And I think that the the, the, while most of our political leaders are extremely clever people that are masters of conceptual thought, not all of them, but most of them are, the way they communicate, the, the concepts they put out in the world and, and the kind of concepts and forms of activity they foster are a whole level below. You know, because what they're involved in is achieving uh, certain ends, they're not involved in, in a science, they're not involved in developing conceptual thought, they're involved in getting elected and holding control, right, so the, the, the quality of the conceptual um, uh, thought is degraded. So I, I mentioned political discourse as a way you can see some of these things, because for example, in political discourse, recognising something by uh, something in common between them, rather than having a concept, it's, it's very common, you know, I've got a brother-in-law that thinks like that. You know, geez, you, you, your child in your year four uh, would be geniuses besides this guy, right? <laughs> um, 
but yeah, actually, when you have a technical or even a medical problem, he's very smart, right? Because he's a technician by trade and faced with sort of scientific type of problems, uh, natural scientific, I mean, right down to medical and medication. But he's very smart, I'll take his advice. But when he's dealing with uh, the kind of discourse environment created by our political and media classes, is completely uh, snowed by that, and, and his level of thought drops a great deal. I know you'll never see this video, uh, so I'm safe in saying these things. Yeah. He's a nice guy anyway. I'm just saying that the what you're calling true concepts don't seem to me to be true in the word of objective. Um, I mean, say, like it says on the chat, that religious concepts are true concept. Now, say. If you're an atheist, mm -hmm. then you don't accept religious concepts, so you wouldn't see that as objective, but a religious person would see them. But they're just true, seems to be just true to, from the person's okay. I explain the way I use the word true. You know, um, if you say that so and so is a true man, yeah, uh, you don't mean he tells the truth. I mean, you have to tell the truth to be a true man, but that's not what you meant, right? Um, what you mean is he conforms to the concept of a man. Right? So it says a true woman conforms to the concept of a woman. But th this house is a true house. So it's tr true here is being used in a Hegelian sense, meaning according with its concept. So it's a little bit of a circle, you've got to excuse me, the concept of a concept is what a true concept is true to. Right? So if we think of what a concept really is, then something that is really a concept in gestation, a concept that isn't yet a concept but it's getting there, that might be a pseudo-concept, but at a certain point when something is grasped for what it is, then ah, that's a true concept. It may be religious, it may be scientific, it may be scientific and it turned out to be wrong, but the, the point is if it's a true concept, yeah. So it's the same saying, Jim. Genuine, yeah, genuine, yeah, but very specifically, meaning it's it's a corresponds to its concept. So, if I, I said that, um, well, it's hard. Pseudo concepts, in a certain sense, are concepts as well. In in the same sense that a child is, after all, also a human being, but they're not yet really all that a human being can be. You know, they can't earn a living, they can't spell their own name, they can't have sex, they can't raise children, you know, they're, they're not yet true human beings. So when we look at complexes and pseudo-concepts, they, they are concepts in a certain meaning of the word, right? but they're not true concepts because they're not yet uh, what a, a, a concept really is, it's not a genuine concept. Right? Well, pseudo, of course, is exactly the opposite. Genuine, isn't it? Okay? So, the, there is ambiguity here, but the ambiguity arises really because the words are being used in a Hegelian sense where there's no ambiguity, it's just very normal. Um, yeah? So, in, this, in your um, chat concepts that you sort of put the individual things, you've got to be that some conscious effort and awareness by means of formal instruction in an institution of some kind. Mm. But as, like, as opposed to just forming the concept in your head and I'm going to run with that. Is that what yeah, yeah, more or less, more yes. Yeah, that, that's good. I'd forgotten about that fact. Um, again, uh, um, I think it's probably okay that we anticipate next week a little bit because it, these things are difficult to grasp and you'll start uh, hit the ground running next week. But uh, true concepts uh, arise within a system of concepts uh, that are appropriate to some institution. So. The, the, the church is, is an institution. You know, it's been there for a couple of thousand years. It, it, it's, you know, uh, it's real. It's not going to disappear. Uh, and and it, it has generated all sorts of concepts that are part of its way of life. Yeah? And, and you can go along to a school and you'll learn these concepts. You'll learn what the Holy Trinity is, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and this is what it means. Here's the Virgin Mary, whatever. Now, um, the, the, the Protestant kid who lives down the road, if you ask him what the Virgin Mary is, he said, you know, it's that statue up front outside the Catholic Church. 
and you know, as I, I got on to you where you can find another one, you know, in the museum around the corner, there's a Virgin Mary there as well. So the, the, that child hasn't been given uh, anything like a true concept of Virgin Mary. The true, the, uh, the, the child getting a religious education hasn't yet really got a true concept either. But the, the, because, whatever, it's still on the road, but you get the point. The, the, the concept of Virgin Mary, Holy Trinity, all these things, heaven and hell, are concepts belonging to an institution. Now, some of us are right into science, and we value concepts that are part of science. Um, now, in what Vygotsky wrote, he wrote about spontaneous or everyday concepts on one hand, and scientific concepts on the other. And this, and he talked about the scientific concepts being true concepts, created a lot of confusion. You've got to understand, in, in the 1930s in the Soviet Union, there were not religious institutions. There were not sporting institutions. There were not educational institutions. There was only one institution, and that was the Soviet state. And the Soviet state was based on science. Yeah. So it, 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 the, the situation didn't arise about talking about true concepts existing in an institution in a country where there was only one institution. And, and not only did he talk about scientific concepts, but when he gave examples, he always took the, the concepts of, of Marxist social science as his examples. He didn't take, uh, for instance, uh, continuity of, of, of volume um, or the force of gravity as his examples, which Piaget might have. He took um, Kulak or value or class, you know, concepts taken from Marxist social science, not because he was a crawler, I mean he wasn't, believe me, at all. He, he, he took those concepts because they preeminently were concepts you had no hope in hell of grasping from your everyday life and experiences. And I think there's a, one of the examples in thinking of your speech where uh, kids are asked, you know, how do you know what a Kulak is? Oh, they must have very big houses. Know, but, uh, or what a capitalist is, that's right, they must have very big houses. The, the, the difference essentially is that you, 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 the, a scientific concept cannot be grasped from everyday experience. Now Piaget took as his examples, uh, examples of really basic physics. And of course the thing is that we do form concepts of basic physics in our everyday experience. And, and, and the contribution that Piaget made is show how you don't just learn the concepts of basic physics when you go into a classroom, you actually go into the classroom already with concepts, but they're mistaken. Right? But he introduced the idea that in the process of teaching something, you don't start with a blank slate. You're actually asking people to change from one paradigm to another. So, he, so him and Kuhn together uh, made a change in the way uh, in learning theory as a result. Okay? But the problem with Piaget's approach in taking concepts that children could already form a concept of, but one that wouldn't stand up to scientific scrutiny, was he, he blurred the distinction between a spontaneous concept or everyday concept and a scientific concept. By taking something like capitalism, that a child may have an idea of capitalism and brought up the Soviet Union because they would be getting lectures about it in kindergarten, right, as it happened. But however they got their idea of capitalism, it wouldn't be through personal experience. It would be book learning, right? And, and their ability to grasp that would be re reflect their, the extent to which they put some flesh and blood on what they learned from a book. So by taking those kind of concepts as examples of scientific concepts, uh, he was able to look at the specific development of concepts which arise out of institutions, what I call true concepts, or he calls them true concepts as well. But I'm broadening the field, not just Marxist social science, but any institution. Okay. We're at eight o'clock. 
Doesn't time fly when you're having fun? Um, okay, we'll continue this. We'll hit the ground running next week because we'll, we'll go right into true concepts next week and see how we're doing it. Thank you very much.